Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is November 14th, 2011, and my guest is Michael Munger. Michael, welcome back to Econ Talk. It's my favorite thing, Russ. Thanks for having me on. You're my favorite guest. Uh, you're, you're by <laughs> no, far. I love you more. <laughs> Your turn. Okay. Uh, our topic for today is profits, and you want to use three stories that you've chosen to illustrate the role of profit and error. Get us started. Well, let me start with a, a joke because it's never a bad thing to do that. This is a joke that I think most economists tell most intro economic students, and yet it still is awfully useful. There's an economist, a neoclassical economist, and an entrepreneur walking along a street. The entrepreneur glances down and sees a $20 bill being an expansive sort of fellow. He says, look, tell you what, we're walking together. Let's split the $20 bill. We both saw it. And the economist says, no, actually, in equilibrium, there couldn't possibly be a $20 bill because somebody would have picked it up. So no thank you. The entrepreneur shakes his head, picks it up, puts it in his pocket, and keeps the whole $20. It's a real knee slapper. I, I tell, <laughs> I, I tell that joke also, but I tell it, uh, I tell it with a psychologist, and I put joke in quotes. But uh, go, go, go <laughs> well, by joke, you, you mean it's supposed to be funny? It's yes, a, it's a it's a jest. Yes, that's correct. So it's it's a jibe even at, at economists who believe that profit opportunities uh, disappear. Well, the, the thing is that, and what we're going to talk about today is profits. The question is, what is the source of profits? And the neoclassical economist would say it's a nonsense question because there's generally no such thing. The only way you can have profits is a rate of return that's above the competitive rate of return. And as we all know, if we make the assumptions necessary for competitive equilibrium, there will be no profits. They'll all be driven down to zero because price is driven to the cost of production. Now, that's one of the genius things about competitive economics. That's certainly right. The question is, why is it in the real economy we see profits, and why do they seem so important? And the reason that I was interested in this was it seems that that profits have have kind of become a, a, a bad word. It's something that the people in Occupy Wall Street and around the country have have are angry about. Yeah, I agree. Well, the profits have always had a an, um received a mixed welcome from the populace at large, right? And it, it depends where they come from. Now, you, you remember the uh, movie Wall Street in 1987, the first Oliver Stone Wall Street. Gordon Gecko gives this iconic speech. Greed, for lack of a better word, is good. Greed is right. Greed works. Greed clarifies, cuts through, and captures the essence of the evolutionary spirit. Greed in all its forms, greed for life, money, love, knowledge, has marked the upward surge of mankind. Uh, Gordon Gecko is not the hero of that movie. I, I hope you're reading that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, good. Okay. M- maybe you liked it enough to memorize it. I. I it is. It's an evil speech because capitalism does not celebrate greed. Capitalism takes greed as a given and celebrates consumer sovereignty. So anything that starts with greed is good is wrong. It's a mischaracterization of capitalism. No one has ever believed that. What capitalism does is try to harness greed and use it for the good of consumers. Yeah, I we've talked about this before, but the idea that somehow the wealth of nations is about greed being good because it gets channeled by competition to help consumers is is not a Smithian idea. It's a caricature of Smith. He obviously understood that people were self interested, but he saw greed the way we use it in everyday language to be a, a not not a virtue uh, even. Even if it's it is, channeled. It is not a virtue. And in fact, one of the reasons that I'm sympathetic with some of the Occupy Wall Street protesters is we have created a society which under some circumstances has confused profits with rents. So profits are what you do when you produce something that somebody else wants to buy and you do it at a low enough price that you can make more revenues than it costs you to make it. Rents are when you invest in government policies for protection, for uh, price floors, for uh, – Barriers to entry. Barriers to entry that actually are more profitable in an accounting sense, but produce nothing for the society. 
And Mike, you should clarify another uh, expression you used earlier. When you talk, when economists talk about zero profit, we don't mean that you don't have any uh, any left over. Want to clarify that? Sure. Um, and the economists and accountants argue about this all the time, and you can just imagine how exciting that is. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a new reality uh, TV show coming out on cable. Uh, accountants <laughs> no, versus economists. Yeah, uh, and then they'll both argue in technical language about what profits course. are. Yeah. For, for, for the accountant, profits are the amount of money you make over labor costs and the cost of materials. For the economist, you have to include in your costs the rate of return that you would get on your capital. So a zero, zero profit condition means that the person who's invested their money gets exactly the opportunity cost rate of return on that capital. So if the rate of return... If the rate of return is 10%, I've got $1,000. I'm making $100 profits. It's just that that's the profit I would get from investing it somewhere else. The, next the economist best calls that zero profit. Yeah, the next best alternative. Yeah. So I'm doing no better with – a zero profit means I'm doing no better with my assets than I could do with them elsewhere. And that would include my time. So when an entrepreneur, you know, an entrepreneur who starts a business and is able to pay himself a salary of, say, $3,000 because that's what's left over – after paying all the costs and, and taking in the revenue, that's that that presumably that's a losing. Uh, that's a ne- those are negative economic profits because the entrepreneur could have done something more valuable with his or her time that would pay more than three thousand dollars. You might choose to stay in that field if you had enough uh, of a cushion and you love doing that enough. But in general, we would say that that's not going to be a going concern. Yeah. So the accountant and the tax man say you're making three dollars three thousand dollars profit. The economist would say, "No, you probably could be earning money. five thousand, and so you're actually or making 50, a loss for fifty. You know, yeah. working as a employee somewhere else, or and, and that's your that's your opportunity cost, and therefore you 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 have negative economic profits. Yeah, you're, you're, that's a loss to the economist, but profits to the the accountant. So that sounds nice. That that's the story that that profits when earned uh, through pleasing customers is, is, are good." And when not earned, uh, pleasing us, but rather by getting some special privilege or bad. Do we have anything else to say? Well, yeah, I, I, I think it is important. And the reason I wanted to start with that, as you pointed out, hilarious joke, was, oh, gosh. Um, that we need to recognize what the source of profits are. The source of profits is correcting errors. The, the economy around us is full of errors. And what I mean by errors is a maladjustment, a divergence between what we're actually producing and what we, I'm making air quotes, should produce in order to use the, the stuff that we have, our mental resources, physical capital, labor, to produce the highest possible level, level of satisfaction of what the public wants. So there's this unobservable thing that nobody knows and nobody can know. And that's what is it that a consumer sovereignty oriented society would produce how are we going to allocate our resources there's all sorts of mistakes in the way that we're allocating resources now if we're not making iPods for example if we're not making things that people want to buy even if they don't know that they want to buy it the genius of Steve Jobs in some ways was to say here's the way people want to buy music they don't know it but if we do it we correct this mistake I can make a lot of money and people will be able to get the music they want in a very cheap and easy way, and they can listen to it on the street. And he could so, have been wrong, in which case he would have lost a lot of money. And... He was wrong about the Apple II. <laughs> it uh-huh. was a disaster. Yeah. So he, he had a history of some, some really bad mistakes. He, he's, but you're constantly trying to, to correct mistakes, not in the sense that, oh, you've said 4 plus 4 equals 9. It's not a mistake anybody could recognize. It's a mistake that resources are misallocated now, and I can allocate them in a way that will produce more value for the society than it costs to produce it. That's what the profits come from, correcting mistakes. And where, where does that lead us? Well, I, in trying to illustrate this point, have the three little stories that we've, we've talked about in some ways before, but I thought it would be nice to link the three of them in the podcast today because I think they have the, a, a nice unifying theme. Okay, before you do that, I just want to add one footnote to the um, the economist and the, the companion walking along the street where the companion sees the $20 bill, gets excited, and the economist says, don't bother. If it were really there, somebody would have picked it up already. And although, of course, the first person who picks it up, there has to be a first person. Um, 
Uh, and that's what The Economist is relying on. That's the sort of paradox of, of zero profits, right? You, you, you claim that there aren't any profit opportunities in some sense in equilibrium to the extent such a thing exists. But you have to recognize that the reason there aren't is that somebody has to have been the first person to see it. I think the value of that story, and, and I'm, I'm going to make a little plea for it before we talk about the, the other three stories, is that so many times – People think they have inside information or they know there's a bargain or they have a great stock they want to buy or they think they can make a lot of money. And that's – that joke about the economist walking down the street is a very useful cautionary tale because your first thought should be – and really this is wonderful advice. Be careful. It, 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 it probably isn't there. Someone probably picked up that easy $20 bill before – you saw it and and it's gone. It's an illusion and someone's trying to – worse, someone's trying to sell you something by Im implying there is such a thing. I was, uh, I'm really amazed at how many of my colleagues who themselves in some cases are quite politically left um, actually had 100 percent of their money invested in the stock market in 2007, 2008 and now they can't retire. They yeah. thought it was a sure thing. Right. Um, and there's lots – we're very prone to the sure thing psychologically. It's so exciting to get a free lunch. Uh -huh. And so when someone says, you know, this has never gone down or this goes up 10% every year or the average is 10% for the last 100 years, you can't lose money on it. Um, think of that story. It's always a uh, good advice. And this is, I don't know if we've ever talked about this, but there's this story that uh, at lunch at the University of Chicago faculty club sometime in the – I think probably the 60s. Uh, George Stigler used to tell the story that there was this arbitrage opportunity, meaning two goods of the same quality were selling for different prices, which means you could buy the cheap one and then resell it at the place where it was more expensive. And have it be a sure thing. And it's a sure thing. You can't lose. It's uh, I think it was a ton of wheat in the United States and a ton of wheat in England. Uh, they, in, they got all excited. This is an embarrassing story. We won't name all the names, but George Stigler <laughs> told the story that they got all excited. They bought the – Wheat in, in the United States, a contractor they prepared to sell in England only to discover that a ton in England <laughs> is not the same as a ton in the United States. And George Stigler used to summarize that by saying, it was the most expensive lunch I ever had. <laughs> um, so the, that's the uh, – of all people, Chicago economists should have realized that there's no free lunch. There's not $20 bills lying around. But if you're lucky, you might be the first person to find such a thing. And it, isn't it interesting that the problem is that hard? I don't know if you remember, but in the in the seventies, uh, I remember one Christmas I got a thing called a pet rock, and it was a rock <laughs> in a box. And yeah. if you would come to me with as an investment <laughs> opportunity and say, you know what we're going to do? We're going to put rocks in boxes and sell them to people, and we're going to sell millions. I'd have said, no, I don't think so. I'm going to leave that twenty bill, twenty dollar yeah. bill on the ground. Thank you. Yeah, that's true. Every once in a while. Well, but the, the, if you think. It's you have inside information. You're almost certainly wrong. If yes. Bernie Madoff comes to you and says, "I can make triple the return and there's no risk," it's a lie. It's yeah. not true. Yeah, for sure. So the the question is, why does anyone ever invest? Why is it that people actually take these chances when we all know if we think about it, you're probably not going to? Although secretly we think each of us thinks we're God's special snowflake, and in fact, no, I can probably guess. <laughs> Um, so, Mike, you proposed to me that we discuss three stories, three that we have talked about in the past in various amounts of detail, and you've now we've set this in the frame of of profit and and correcting errors. So, let's uh, start with the first story, and um, what what do you want to tell us? What the story is, and what well, do you want to say about it? We'll tell us the story. We'll do it chronologically. Now, I'm a very egotistical person, and so I I Google myself eight or ten times a day. That's but... your God's special snowflake. Come on. <laughs> Um, but I, I, it was harder for me to Google myself in the 11th century, but yes. I did find a way to Google myself in the 11th century by trying to find out what was the origin, the etymological origin of my name, which is Munger. So a few hundred years ago, it was Munger, M-O-N-G-E-R. And in Anglo-Saxon, in the 11th century, it was a word called Mankgear, M-A-N-C-G-E-R-E, -E, which meant merchant of just the, the lowest sort. And it turned out that there was a, a mention of the mank year in a uh, translation by a woman named Sh Sharon Turner in a three-volume history of the Anglo-Saxons that was published in 1836. And, but this is from 1050. It was a psalter. That is a place where you would sing psalms from, but they also had stories, sort of character stories. And this was in the, the Northern Hanseatic League. Uh, 
a trading the, organization. A bunch of city states loosely affiliated by trade, but it was pretty dangerous. And so the Mank Gear introduces himself in the Psalter by saying, you can tell he's defensive. <laughs> Uh, it's, 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 he's not calm about this. I say I am useful to the king, to the elderman, and to the rich, and to all people. I ascend my ship with my merchandise, and I sail over the sea-like places. It sounds like it should be Monty, but the sea-like places. Yeah. <laughs> and I sell my things and buy dear things which are not produced in this land. I bring them to you here with great danger over the sea, and sometimes I suffer shipwreck with the loss of all my things, scarcely escaping myself. And the interlocutor asks, well, what things do you bring us? Skin, silk, costly gems, gold, various garments, pigment, wine, he goes on. Uh, Will you sell your things here as you brought them here? And it it sounds like he's saying, are you going to change them? And he says, no, not only am I not going to change them, I will not, because then what would my labor benefit me? I will sell them dearer here than I bought them there, that I may get some profit to feed me, my wife and children. So what he's doing is traveling pretty far at considerable risk to himself, bringing back stuff that he thinks people want to buy. Is he changing them in any way? No, there's no production. It's a parasite. There's no no pretense that he's doing anything but being a parasite. Yeah. Uh, I'm a mank here and I'm okay. I sleep all (laughs) night and I sail all day. Uh, um, So this is a, I rather this is 1050 a uh, thousand yeah. years ago. It's a remarkable document because it's timeless, unfortunately, or not. It, it's exactly the way an economist, at least, would defend the role of a merchant, in particular one who's, um, you know, you could you could gussy it up and call him a retailer, um, but he's really not even a retailer. He's just a a middleman of of the most uncreative sort on the surface. He provides transportation services, I suppose you could say, but he's he, he's not saying I'm charging for transportation. He's saying I'm going to charge the most that I can get because otherwise what would my labor get me? And the defensiveness is interesting. That hasn't because changed either. The, at, not long before this, Aquinas, actually not long after this, but the, the sentiment had been there for a while, Thomas Aquinas had asked in, I think, question 74 of Summa Theologica, is it a sin to sell something for more than it is worth? And it's important that we take some of the parts of Aquinas' objection about the just price doctrine. Is it a sin to sell something for more than it is worth? Well, suppose that he sold something for gold that, in fact, was just iron. That would be fraud. That you can't do. Suppose it was coercive. Suppose I didn't have enough information to know what it was that you were selling. All of those things might be a sin. We might now say they should be illegal. So let's put all those things aside. Let's suppose that all he has done is made a very large profit, more than it cost him to transport the stuff by a lot. He went and bought the stuff. He brings it to you, and he he represents precisely what it is and asks me, how much are you going to pay for it? A number of people are clustered. They're lined up because all of them want this, and they bid against each other, he ends up making a huge profit. Has he committed a sin, or in modern terms, has he done something that we would now say we're going to make illegal? He's brought back an orange from the Orient, and yeah. people don't get oranges in 1050 except He's brought the back source. spices that mean that the spoiled meat that I eat in my soup actually doesn't taste so bad. Might not make me sick. So, the, the, the question is, is as he as he behaved evilly, and Aquinas sort of goes back and forth on this question. And he makes an exception for just price on people who are primarily merchants, and says, "Well, they're not really behaving morally, but they're also not behaving immorally. This is just a region of our civil life where the usual questions of morality don't apply." That's a tepid endorsement, but it it's it it, it you could yeah. do worse. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. Yeah, it's it's sort of monstrous, but we'll make an exception. Yeah, yeah what are you gonna expect? These people are traitors. Yeah. It's awkward. And so the for always there has been this idea and in, in some ways in, in Confucianism, not so much in Islam. Um Muhammad was a traitor, so it was it was okay. Trade was okay in the Islamic world, and that's part of the reason why the Islamic world flourished for a long time, between 800 and 1200, 
there was a lot of trade in the Islamic world before really there was in, in Europe. The question is, what is the status of the trader? And here's the argument that I would want to make. The fact that this man, the Mank gear, is making profits is prima facie evidence that he's giving a huge benefit to people who are voluntarily buying the stuff that he brought back, provided there's no fraud and no coercion. He's doing a huge public service. He should have been celebrated rather than this tepid endorsement. Yeah, you know how traders are. Yeah, it's a it's an incredible thing, and it's not – that attitude really hasn't changed. I think I, – I don't know where it comes from exactly. It, it may just it, – some of it's cultural. It may be some – in some dimension hardwired into us. But when I talk to my students about this uh, – and, and this illustrates another example of a distinction between economic profit and accounting profit. Uh, economists tend not to care about historical price. Uh, what you paid for the good originally, but rather what replacement cost is. And when I first moved to Washington, D.C., uh, the house I wanted to buy and the neighborhood I wanted to buy, I was able to – it's public information. I, I was able to see that the owner who had bought the house uh, about 30 years before – about 25 years, 35 years before I had, uh, he had paid one-tenth of what he was charging me. And if I had gone to him and said, you know, I think five times what you paid for it would be plenty. Yeah, it would, it would, that would be enough to motivate you to take care of the house. He would say, well, I can get ten times, mm -hmm. and that's the market price. And and in that situation, n nobody is outraged that, that the owner of the house is gouging me because yeah. that's what houses of, quote, comparable amenities and 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 size and location tend to earn for the seller. And so – uh, no one objects to the fact that he was charging what everyone else was charging. Now, one of the things that's unusual, we've talked about this a lot in our, our previous podcasts on these type of topics, You know, if you've got the only orange, somehow it does feel different uh, than if there's 40 orange sellers, all of whom have gone to the, co to the trouble of going to get them, which is what a grocery, a grocery store is competing or doing that. They've, they've incurred costs. We understand they're entitled to a profit. But they don't earn the profit because of competition that, that they might earn if there were only one grocery store. It raises the question, does anybody earn profits? There's a big question in philosophy about dessert, and I've become interested in this. The word dessert is complicated. So dessert actually comes from uh, – well, there's a, there's a number of forms of the word dessert, as you probably know. One is the sweet stuff yep. that, that we're going to ignore. Um, I, well, wish I think I it's. I think it's the same word. <laughs> it, it, no, it I'm serious. Not, it's the same I, root, which is it's. Isn't it, it, it what I, you're entitled to? It, I, no, I, I looked it up, and dessert with two s's means to clear the table. It's the the, uh, the you deserve. So it's de deserve the French uh -huh. middle French deserve with two s's afters. And it's so it's to clear the table after the meal, and that's that's why we have sweets at the end of it. That's okay. what we do to clear the table. There is a very similar word, um, deservir, with one S, that means uh, something of virtue or merit, that I deserve it. The strange thing is that it, French is a very irregular language, and dessert, deserte, actually, I, I'm probably mispronouncing, I'm sure it's dessert, but it's D-E-S-E-R-T-E, -E -E, is to deserve, mm -hmm. that is, to merit uh, Yeah, you're reward or punishment. So I'd always assumed that they were the same. They're actually completely different, and that's also different from uh, the idea of deserting or leaving, which is also Middle French, and that's um, deservir with an E, which means to leave. And so the water has left the desert, you leave your military unit. So it's actually three different French words, words for very similar English words. So the, the phrase just deserts. I actually yeah. did some research on this. I am a crack researcher. I was interested. The, the phrase just deserts. The second word has one S, not two. Hmm. But there's four million instances I on Google that. Yeah. with two S's. So yeah. just desserts should be like a cake shop. We make just desserts. We yeah. don't sell pizza. <laughs> but just dessert means I justifiably expect to get to keep that. And so the, the question, and you've raised it very well, and it is we can split the difference. Sure, you deserve some profit. Sure, you deserve some part of the, the increase of the value of the house. But not that much. That's too much. And so 
you don't deserve all of the profits that you have gotten because you haven't earned them. So the question that, that, that uh, Rawls, for example, John Rawls raised in Theory of Justice and elsewhere was, why would any of us think that we deserve any of the character or effort or intelligence that lead us to perform well? So suppose that we make an, a theory of desert in the sense, you deserve this because you own, in some sense, your own talents. Well, Rawls says you got those from your parents. You won a genetic lottery. Those are morally arbitrary. We may decide that you get to keep some of it, but only the only what is necessary to motivate you to do what's good for society. The things that you know, the things that you do, your character, those are collectively owned. They're not privately owned, according to that theory of desert. It's a very discomforting idea, isn't it? I, it's widely held. <laughs> yeah, I it's, think... It is absolutely widely held, and that's the, that's the basis. You, you really set this up perfectly. I think a lot of people, maybe not for a house, but um, will say, you're making too much profits, and so we're going to have an excess profits tax. That'll be these oil companies, these other kinds of companies that are making big profits. They don't need that much. Oh, we'll just we'll take away half, and that'll still motivate them to do what they should do. Yeah, we recently did a podcast with uh, Stephen Kaplan on the top one percent, and he had this remarkable statistic that in a recent year, the top twenty-five hedge fund managers earned uh, in total the top twenty-five earned twenty-five billion in that year. Uh, and it's a skewed distribution, so the top five earned more than five billion, but the average of the top twenty-five was a billion apiece. Surely that is more than enough, right? I think that would it, be the it, average reasonable person in the streets' response. It is. And it might it be is true. More than enough. And it might be true. Yeah. If 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 what you think is, if you start from the premise that all our talents and character are actually collectively owned because they're morally arbitrary, then the only reason that anyone gets to keep profits is to motivate them to do what we want them to do for the public good. So I just made an argument saying profits are actually a sign that I'm doing something for the collective. I'm creating value. The man gear is doing something that makes people better off. Well, my opponent might concede that but say, okay, but then we'll only give them enough profits to motivate them to do what we should want them to do. We don't have to give them the full amount. And as an economist, my response to that is always I, – I have two thoughts on that, and, and I don't know how persuasive they are to non-economists. But my first thought is once you give the power to the state to allocate the rewards, you are going to not be in the world of justice like you hope. You're going to be in the world of rent-seeking and power. Uh, my second thought is – so, OK, I, I, I'm willing to admit that people would still be hedge fund managers, assuming they do something valuable, which I think many of them do. Uh, not all financial folks these days are doing productive things, but many do. And you'd say, well, I, I concede the point that it, a billion is not – is too much in the sense that less than that would still motivate them to do a good job. How would you pick the number that you think is the right number and how would you enforce it? Um, it is really interesting that most of us – Think if we're the defenders of capitalism, I, no one that I know would defend the greed claim. What we defend instead is that what the price system does is provide information about the scarcity of resources, so that we can. It's easier for us to calculate how to correct mistakes. I say, wait, you're using tin for this. It's much more valuable over here. I will buy the tin from you, sell it over here and correct a mistake that makes everybody, including me, better off. The person I bought it from is better off because he's not using the tin, but he's got more money than he would have made. The other guy who values the tin more now creates something more valuable, and I make a profit for doing it. Well, the, the response, yes, but you don't need all of that, it implies somebody else has this information about how much it takes. And they have this information about where the resource should be directed. So the price system provides both information and decentralized motivation for people constantly to be looking around. And a number of people who have, have studied entrepreneurship, because that's what that is, is entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurs correct the errors in allocations of resources, and profits are what they're looking for. They're looking for opportunities to, to correct allocations of resources. So Israel Kirzner and others have called this awareness. What I'm looking for 
is a way to figure out how I can correct a misallocation of resources. So I'm constantly looking around. Entrepreneurship rests on awareness. Well, I think the, argue, the, the, the answer, the best answer to Rawls and the people who say these are morally arbitrary, I suppose that it is. And that's why oh, I, I, wanted, I wanted to have the, the second story about, about the verger because it, the verger illustrates how morally arbitrary some of these features are. But the, the Nozickian answer, that is Robert Nozick's answer to Rawls, was, of course, it's, it's too high a standard. It's silly to say that you deserve this all the way back to some kind of primeval uh, having created something so fundamental that the society couldn't do without it. But we could settle on something intermediate, which is you're entitled to it. You're entitled to it because as a liberal society, we're going to adopt a value of personal autonomy. So the presumption of personal autonomy, it can be overcome. You commit a crime, you lose your autonomy. But it's a pretty high bar to say, unless you do something that harms other people, you own yourself. You own your own labor. And that definition of autonomy would mean that while I don't deserve the profit in some moral sense, I'm entitled to it in the sense that we accept that in a market society, people who take certain actions and create values get to reap the reward. So it's about it's a question of ownership and property, not moral desert. But so I don't... It, it, Go ahead, sorry. It, it, it's a misrepresentation to insist you would have to deserve it if property and entitlement get you to the same place. See, I think underlying that, and I, I, the easiest way for me to think about this is, is Steve Jobs because he's you know such a dramatic example – Underlying that idea is that the reason I'm entitled to it is the presumption that I'm helping others, not just myself. Uh, if by engaging if, – if life were a zero-sum game and if by engaging my skills, say, as a warrior, uh, I was able to amass wealth, wealth and, and goods by, by plunder, by taking them from you, we'd say, well, that's not moral. The fact that you're, you were born stronger than I am, that you had – you had better weapons either because they were her inherited through your family or you had created them through gifts that you had been bestowed on by, by nature or God. That's irrelevant. It's ultimately got to come down to the fact that you make folks better. So I look at Steve Jobs. He dies and his estate's reportedly worth about $6.6 .6 billion. $4.4 billion of that is Disney stock that he got from selling Pixar to, to uh, Disney. 2.2, ironically, a half, roughly half, came from what most people think of when they think of Steve Jobs, which is the profits from his Apple stock at the time of his death that he owned. And nobody, incredibly, when he died, part of its death, death's always has, has some interesting reputational effects. Before he died, people complained he didn't give enough of it away. It wasn't, quote, charitable enough. Uh, he didn't do enough for human beings. It's clear to me he did a remarkably large amount of human beings. He gave us to some extent Pixar. He wasn't the only one, of course, but he gave us those remarkable visual treats. And then he transformed the music and information business through the iPod, and the iPad, and, and the Mac computer. And those are just glorious gifts that we benefited. So his $6.6 .6 is a fraction of his total contribution to the world. It's a not trivial a trivial fraction. It's actually a very small fraction. So we got most of it. He got a lot. He did get a lot. So somebody says he got too much. Yes, he, he would have done it anyway for a much smaller share. I, But I think the reason we celebrate the man is we recognize that the pie got bigger by so much more than that $6.6 .6 billion that, that we say, okay, that's okay. Yeah. As it turns out, we couldn't have known that in advance. And in fact, one Very of the articles point. I wrote for you some time ago, he tried several times to sell his ideas about personal computers to HP, and they said, "Are you kidding? Nobody's ever going to buy this." Yeah. So it was that it was that awareness. Now, yes, he also made some mistakes, but overall, the things that he created, it's a, a huge amount of value. Many of the people now who are saying he got too much are reading about his death on something that would not exist if he had not lived. Yeah. They're looking at a device that would not exist. Ironic. So, but, you know, he had certain gifts. <clears throat> he used them to the fullest. His sister wrote a rather extraordinary uh, eulogy, delivered a rather extraordinary eulogy that was reprinted, and I'll, we'll put a link up to it. 
and um, she, she chronicled, among many other things, his relentless work effort. Many people are given great gifts, and they don't pursue them. Um, my eighth grade teacher, Miss Kinnean, used to say it's better to have a, a, a half-gallon capacity and fill it to the top than to have a gallon capacity and only fill it up to a quart. <laughs> and um, she's right, right? Many gifted people don't use their gifts, and many people who have average gifts use them to such for, with such ferocity that and such intensity that they still make a contra- an important contribution that's greater than that than the gifted person. And that whole well, okay, ahead. Well, wh- why did he do that? Why did he work so hard? He can't really claim any credit for having been born with a character, with perhaps drive. been raised by his parents with a character. Uh, it, it still should be collectively owned if you're going to insist on a theory of desert. That's why I think an enti- Nozickian entitlement theory makes a lot more sense. Insisting on desert means nobody ever owns or deserves anything, and we're making collective decisions. We've raised two problems with that. One is the incentive problem that you raised, where we'd constantly be litigating about whether I get anything or arguing with Congress. The second is information. How would anybody know any of these things if we had to decide them collectively? We would have looked at personal computers and said, no, nobody wants that. And the committee would have turned it down. We wouldn't have any. Yeah. Waste ex ante. I mean, it's a very deep point. It's hard to hard to remember it and hard to appreciate it, that ex ante, the knowledge isn't there. And um, and the process is, is that – uh, James Buchanan piece that we've I've cited a few times here. I'll put a link up to that also. It's the process that creates the knowledge. The knowledge isn't given to the participants. And so we often, and this is like the, the $20 bill, John Stuart Mill in 1848 and his principles of political economy tried to make a distinction between production and distribution. He said production we have to do obviously through something like capitalism because that produces the most, that's the way of organizing society and pr- production that's most efficient. But it's, it's not like that with distribution. The things once there, mankind individually or collectively can do with them as they like. They can place them at the disposal of whomsoever they please and on whatever terms. So we can divide the benefits from capitalist production as we want. And the, the problem with that is the things once there. He's assuming that which would have to be proved, that we wouldn't have iPods unless Steve Jobs had had enough autonomy to make that decision partly in, in, in search of profits, but profits didn't motivate him he was motivated by profits, but not many, solely. Yeah, he was motivated, he was motivated by, by fame. Yeah, fame, uh, uh, a commitment to an artistic vision, a thousand things, obviously. But, but still, we can't assume that the things are there. And so we can't just say production is one stage, but distribution is entirely separate. The 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 maladjustments that will come from not having the incentives to be able to capture the profits from things that I create will metastasize back into our – distribution decisions. I agree with that, but I also have to concede, and I, I'm curious what your re- thoughts are on this. I think the incentive effects are of unknown magnitude. Economists who want to defend uh, low rates of taxation, small levels of government will often invoke large incentive effects of, of taxation as a way of saying, yeah, well, if we, if we raise taxes too high, people won't do creative stuff, and we need these for incentive reasons. I don't know if that's true, and I don't think there's any good evidence for it other than our our armchair theorizing, which is real. I think there is an effect, Uh, but again, I don't think I don't think hedge fund managers uh, without a billion dollars would work a lot less hard. I don't think, uh, other than to say that well, but they would go into other investment opportunities, and that so the market's a funny thing. It has all these related uh, payments that that do matter to the participants. Uh, It's it's obvious that. If you lower the wage to lawyers, uh, more people, uh, fewer people go to law school, and they may become something else. But if we lowered all the wages of all the ex, say that post after tax wages of all high skilled activities, it's not obvious to me that the world would be a dramatically poorer place. I, I think it might be. It's a risky procedure. But again, I, my main argument against uh, confiscatory taxation, and I don't mean literally, but a high tax rates isn't so much the efficiency effects but the power effects, the mm-hmm. the distortions that, that are going to occur because I don't think I don't think those two elements can really be separated. The incentive yeah, well, problem and the distortions that come from having to argue about it all the time and the I would say agnostic position where we just don't know enough to set prices right means that we're often going to accept 
levels of profits in some areas that just look obscene and, in fact, cannot be justified on any sort of moral claim. Let's move on to our second story, which is a Somerset Mom short story, uh, The Verger. Tell us the, the outlines of the story. Well, he it was published a couple times, um, once as The Man Who Made His Mark in 1929, but then it was republished in 1936 in a magazine called Cosmopolitan under the name The Verger. And just going through it quickly, there was um, a, a verger is a, a kind of helper, a, a lay helper for the the priest or the, the vicar, because these are Anglican churches in, in England. He worked in uh, St. Peter's in Neville Square, and his name was Foreman. The, the verger had been working there since he was 17. He was now 37, so he'd been working there for 20 years and had done a great job, was very committed, didn't get paid very much, but he had a little house out back, and he, he, was, he got paid in food. So he was basically paid in kind and had committed his life to, to St. Peter's there in Neville Square. Well, they, they had a new vicar, and they had uh, the representatives of the, the lay committee that helped the vicar administer St. Peter's, and it, it turned out one day that Foreman, the verger, had never learned how to read and write. He had left school early and then had hooked on as verger uh, when he was 17 and had never learned how to read and write. The vicar was appalled at this. This is the modern Anglican church. We can't be have people like this that work for us. It's It's embarrassing. So they called him in, and they said, look, you've done a great job. We're really sorry, but we're going to have to let you go. And he was disconsolate. He, he, we couldn't believe that he'd been let go after all this loyalty uh, 20 years. And did a great um, job. And, and it, that no one doubted he had done a great job. And he, in fact, he asked, you know, what, what of my work is inadequate? Well, nothing, but you can't read and write. And, you know, that's, it's just we can't have that sort of person here. We need to have someone who's, who's more sophisticated, more able to deal with the increasingly sophisticated parish that here, here at, at St. Peter's. So I'm, I'm sorry, I think, you have to go. But I, I want to emphasize, this is, a, this is a short story. This is fiction. Uh, my memory of the story uh, is also that it was just embarrassing. They, they felt it was unseemly. Yeah. It wasn't that he wasn't – he clearly could do all the things that the job required. He did them exceptionally well, but they thought they should get someone who was – looked better because he could read and write. And it, it would it would be embarrassing if, if it came out that uh, it, sure. they, they thought it would be embarrassing for the church and for the other people. They weren't really worried about him. They were mostly worried that it would be sure. embarrassing for the church. And so what happens? Well, he's unhappy, and he's not a drinking man, but he does think that since he's unhappy, he'd like to have a cigarette. Looks up and down this long street of sh- shops and houses and there's no tobacconist. And he thinks, well, it's odd. There's no tobacconist in this whole long street. He has a little bit of money saved up because he had no expenses the whole time he'd been living there. And he rents a place, buys a a few supplies, and opens a tobacco shop, and works really hard, and before long is able to open another tobacco shop. And his rule is pretty simple. He can't read or write, but he walks around neighborhoods and the place where there's no tobacconist for three or four blocks, he opens one. It's very small. It's the Starbucks model of location. <laughs> with, with, with very low costs. And it's the, you know, the, he's going to hit them where they ain't, as, as, as we, will, we Willie Keeler said about baseball. Yeah. We'll, we'll locate these uh, tobacco shops. And he ended up with 10. He ended up with 10 tobacco shops. And after a period of 15 years, he had saved up 100,000 pounds, a gigantic fortune. From his profits. Yeah, the, 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 he, had, he had saved up from the excess of his revenues over his costs, $100,000. And those were profits. Those were evidence that people found the, the products that he was selling cheap, convenient, and it was repeat business in the sense they kept coming back. Um, you know, to, in some ways, tobacco is tobacco, but he, it was low price and it was low cost because I could just walk half a block instead of four blocks to another tobacconist. He had made a large amount of money on very small increments by giving people what they wanted. Now, maybe it's unfortunate this is tobacco. It's not okay that it's tobacco now. Yeah, when but he wrote it, it was a be- more beautiful, inspiring at, story. At it's the time, yes. Yeah. T- tobacco was an okay thing. To, to sell. In fact, movie stars would smoke on screen and, and, and so, so on. And athletes would sell them and advertise yeah. them. Well, he, 
he's worried about having all this cash because that's at the, at the time it's a fortune, an absolute fortune. So he, he goes to the bank to deposit it, and the the man at the bank is very impressed that he has managed to save all of this uh, just from simple profits from this, this simple trade, and gives him some forms to sign. And the verger foreman says, "The ex-verger, yeah, I'm, 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 yeah, the ex-verger says, I, I'm sorry, uh, I." I can't read or write. I, I can't sign them. I'll need to get somebody to read these for me. And the, the banker is incredulous and says, you have amassed this fortune. You can't read and write. Imagine what you could have done if you could read and write. And Foreman says, well, I know the answer to that. I would be the verger <laughs> at St. Peter's. Uh, it's a um, little Somerset mom humor. That's how it ends. Right? <laughs> well, it, it's it's funnier than the economist in the stock It brokers. is. I was thinking the same thing. That's why, <laughs> that's why I said it. But it's uh, it's an unusual Somerset mom story because it ends with kind of that with that little. Uh, it's a punchline. Yeah, yeah. With the punchline. Yeah, like it, it's it it is totally an extended sort of a shaggy dog. It joke. is. It and really it, is. You might see it coming, but you also might not. Well, this guy doesn't deserve profits in the sense that he made these calculations. He did something very simple. He can't even read or write. He is not someone that you would look to like Steve Jobs. You know, a sort of transcendent genius. This is a guy who said, you know, I think I can make some money. And he had no particular vocation for selling tobacco. He didn't pick it. So he's, he's like the, the mank gear in that way. The only reason he picked this was he thought he could make profits from doing it. He had no deeper motives to say, all right, I want to help people. It was tobacco. He was selling cigarettes and pipe tobacco and supplies and made a pretty large fortune simply by filling a need that no one was aware of. And that's the hard thing about profits is if you're aware, you make a guess about what it is that people would like. And if you're right, you make profits. I am motivated to do something that no one else has even noticed. So it's not a policy question where we're debating in Congress, should we pick A or B? We don't know that B exists. We don't know that C exists. This alternative is not something that's even been raised. It's something new. So let me give you uh, – here's what I challenge my students with if I use that in my class, which maybe I should. It's a nice – it's a great story. So he, he, dis- he discovers, he creates implicitly knowledge that wasn't there before, which is there aren't enough tobacconists in these locations where he has put his 10 shops. Now that he's done that, that's done. So what we should do is we should take away his franchises – and run them through the government as state-owned tobacco shops and lower the price to a place where, again, neglecting the fact that people now would say tobacco is a bad thing. And, but we do this with, literally with alcohol. <clears throat> we'll lower the – although we don't always lower the price. But we're going to take this knowledge that he's created. We're going to lower the price. And we're going to give people the benefit of this discovery. It's already been done. He's, he got some profit out of it. And now that's enough. Let's, let's not ex- let him c- continue to exploit people. Yep. And because he, he's charging more than it costs him, and we know that because he's making profits. A lot over time. Yep. And so we can do a public service by taking uh, – by nationalizing his his uh, tobacco shops and running them for the benefit of the people instead of the benefit of this illiterate. Because th- this guy, maybe he's okay, but he, is, he has gotten what he deserves. And at this point, he's behaving immorally by charging a price that's actually – higher than it needs to be in order to sustain the service. They're ill-begotten. In fact, this is, again, I think the efficiency argument run – It's you know, I'm going to argue it's run amok. But the argument would be he's already incurred the the cost and, and you could say – excuse me, the he's already incurred the – it created the value. And yeah. now let's let – he's had enough. Let other people do it. Now, the standard argument against that is, well, that will discourage people in the future. And, and the response would be, well, not much. Because he's got to make a hundred thousand pounds, he's gonna. We didn't take it all from him. We didn't say you did nothing. We're just gonna take a, the future benefits that yeah. he's he's got enough. Yeah. And what's your argument? I've got an argument against that, but what's yours, Mike? Well, um, fundamentally, what we've already talked about is the problem of autonomy as a presumption, and we've talked about the John Stuart Mill observation that the things once there. Um, we somehow think, if you if you accept the argument that you just made, we, we somehow think we know enough to be able to say how much is enough. The autonomy claim, I think, is the one that I find more persuasive, because otherwise you're in the position of power where 
the government would say, no, we're going to take it. He would hire a lawyer, and everyone at every point in time is trying to justify their property. That sort of tenuousness, I mean, maybe the, the, the government operating it would be at lower cost. Maybe it wouldn't. It, subjecting him to a continued profit test means that he's actually providing the service that people want at a cost that's lower than the amount they're willing to pay for it. Once the government starts to provide it, we no longer have that information. Yeah, I think, so I think that's the last point, it's the key point, which is maybe there are going to be new ways of providing tobacco more cheaply. Maybe there's new products to be provided. All those incentives would be destroyed. And we have no idea. Or and we, and we wouldn't look. Or maybe there shouldn't be tobacco shops there after a while, which of course would turn out to be the case. As tobacco was decided, uh, was found to be less uh, to be harmful, we need to close some of those, and we don't have to make that decision. The consumers are going to stop buying there because they're going to be cutting back on the tobacco. We might only want to have a, a shop every twelve blocks and not every three. All those decisions, all that information that's dispersed, uh, is solved by letting people pursue profit. Um, and of course, we'd also say, well, let's let new tobacco shops open that might drive the price down yeah. and um, mean that he won't make as much money down the road. We wouldn't – we'd expect him to make money in the beginning. He found something that wasn't there, but other people might compete and open a, sh a shop across the street. He might, because he has 10 shops, be able to do what Walmart has done and take advantage of economies of scale in purchasing. It, it, we don't have enough information. The, the fact that profits are earned or not earned is a really important piece of information, and it provides motivation. So yeah. the, both the decentralized incentives to act <laughs> in certain ways and the information about scarcity is something that you're giving up if you say, all right, we're going to have the government operate this. And it's, it's a very difficult argument to persuade people of because the argument that you made makes so much sense. Okay, we know. Now we can do it at a lower price because now we're going to cut out the middleman and there's not going to be any profits. Yeah. It's um it's always tempting. And of course, tobacco smokers really find it appealing <laughs> that argument. That, that's we always have to remember there is you know, it's a bootlegger and baptist argument. Yeah. Uh they're always uh the direct beneficiaries of this. They're going to describe that it's good for society at large or that there's justice behind it, but they just might want a cheaper smoke. Yeah. Well, we're, we're running short on time. Do you want to talk about the Padre? Well, it's easy to talk about the Padre. We've done it several times, and we can do it fairly quickly. And In fact, it was in a conversation with you in a podcast where I first realized what an interesting example it was. The, the way that it worked, and we can be brief about it, the way that it worked was um, Radford, a man named Radford, economist, was captured by the Germans and put into a prisoner of war camp in 1944. And they got these Red Cross packages once a month, and they all had exactly the same contents. So we're in a sort of thought experiment world where everyone has the same endowments but different preferences. And it might be that for a while I noticed that you didn't eat your tinned carrots because you don't like them. You were going to throw them away. And I said, well, tell you what, why don't you just give those to me? And Redford said they quickly, very soon after capture, people realized it was both undesirable and unnecessary in view of the limited size and the quality of, of supplies to give away or accept gifts. Goodwill developed into trading as a more equitable means of maximizing individual satisfaction. Isn't that amazing? Goodwill developed into trading as a more equitable means of maximizing individual satisfaction. Otherwise, I might say every month, I expect you to give me the, the can of carrots. But somebody else would actually give you one cigarette for the can of carrots where I was expecting them for free. So you, I, I, if I give you something, it's a one-time thing. But since this is repeated over and over, every month we get the, the Red Cross package, we, we, we think that trade is more equitable than, than goodwill. I think that's a remarkable observation. That, that is a remarkable observation. It's... Um... It reminds me of of a, a the person who who collects something, uh, you know, might be knickknacks that have a a particular animal. They're they're people who collect, you know, dog items or pig items or whatever it is. And after a while, everyone realized, oh, this is easy now. I can find a, an easy gift for them. I just have to locate a, a knickknack they don't have that has this theme. It could be sports, whatever it is. Of course, sometimes a person gets tired of that. Uh, decides to drop the hobby, but 
And they'd never buy another one for themselves, but they keep getting those gifts. <laughs> uh, and they have to pretend, oh, another pig, another, hey, another red. So much. Yeah, oh, it's great. Um, but anyway, uh, sorry, carry on. Well, so the Redford then describes what he says was a priest with a sharp eye for exchanges. Stories circulated of a padre who started off round the camp with a tin of cheese and five cigarettes and returned to his bed with a complete Red Cross parcel in addition to his original cheese and cigarettes. So what this guy did was he started out with a small amount of stuff, bought low, sold high, and ended up with a complete Red Cross package, which had a considerable value. With a lot of cigarettes, some beef, some marmalade, some chocolate. Um, Produced nothing of value. All he did was extract all stuff he did from was other take, folks. Take, yeah. take, and take, and take. He, he should be beaten. Well, he left less for everyone else. There's no doubt about that. You can't deny it because the claim is he not only got a different mix of stuff, he, he has the same mix he started with plus more of everything else. Which means everybody – because there's a fixed amount, there's no production in this society yeah. is why it's such a that's, great that's why it's experiment. He um, he clearly extracted stuff from folks, yeah. and yet he was probably doing good in the camp. That certainly was not the view. This was not <laughs> a, a, a story where you know this is someone you should emulate. It was someone who was evil, and they, they called it sharp practices. And in, when I was talking to you about this, I thought it was sort of cool – your reaction and then our conversation about it made me realize this is actually absolutely fundamental to a significant question in philosophy. And I've actually written two papers about it since. And it's the rawls nozick debate. And the, the problem goes like this. How can there be a justification for redistributive taxation, taking from the wealthy and giving to the poor, if every individual transaction that made me rich actually creates benefits for the poor? Now, Fraud, that would be a problem. Coercion, I hold a gun to your head and make you engage in a transaction, that would be a problem. But the, the premise of this example seems to be the padre went up to a bunch of different people and said, I have something, I'll give it to you if you give me something. And in every instance, in every instance, the, the partner in the trade thought he would be made better off. And if we allow that subjectively people are autonomous and Informed, and in this case, they are because every, the, they know the, it's the, in the tin. This is homogeneous. <laughs> they, they know, know it's if it in was the rotten tin or empty or full of rocks. Okay, yeah. but it's not fraud. He made every single person better off. So the fact that he'd made significant profits was actually evidence that he had performed a brokering function. There was a person, A, let's call them, who would like to exchange at a certain price, and there's another person, B, who would be willing to take that price and give A something that he wants, but they've never met. The padre acted as middleman or go-between, making both A and B better off. And By implicitly letting them trade via him, but he took his own little slice. But it, the slice, by definition, has to be less than the total benefit or yep. value that's created by the transaction between A and B if it had happened. Yeah. He can only make money if A's better off and B's better off. He takes some slice, but they still have to both be better off, by definition, if it's a voluntary transaction. And so, to take the analogy with the verger, uh, it's obvious how to make this this camp better off. We ban the padre, and yeah. we just get A and B together without yeah. the padre slice, and therefore yeah. there's even more for A and B because they would have gotten the slice that he that was reserved to the padre who did nothing. Yeah, he did nothing except just be a parasite. Yeah, but problem with that is A and B can't find each other. It's yeah. a big camp. <laughs> furthermore, furthermore, as Radford points out. This was a symptom of sort of a new camp where prices were not yet unified. Actually, what happened was that the verger, forgive me, the, the, the padre, padre. Yeah. the thing that he did was if prices were high in one part of the camp, he would go and sell a bunch of stuff, driving the price down. And he would take it to the, the place where prices were, were, were low, and that's where he would buy what, what he sold. So he by buying low and selling high, actually drove the price together. He picked up the $20 yeah. bill. And there was meant, no $20 bill anymore. Right. Uh, and So they did find each other. They found each other by posting prices on a bulletin board. And so put one, the Padre out of business, eventually. Yes, but you, but you, you want to pick up the $20 bill. That, that's, that's what entrepreneurship does. 
it means that there's no mistakes. There's no misallocation. If I eat a, a carrot of tins, when there's somebody out there that would carrots. give me chocolate for it, I eat a tin of carrots when there's somebody out there that will give me chocolate for it, but I don't know it, that's a misallocation. Yeah. If I give my carrots and get the chocolate, we're both better off. So all that the Padre did was correct errors. All he did was pick up the $20 bill. It's true that after all of his activities, there was no more to pick up. But the question is, why would that ever be a justification for saying, oh, you have too much money? That's that's evil. That's a prima facie evil. We're going to take it and give it back. Because he was motivated by the profits. The reason that he did this was that he wanted to collect that little slice. So we're almost out of time. I'm going to I'm going to give a, a counterpoint to that argument, uh, which you may or may not agree with, uh, which is when in the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis, uh, I've seen this quoted. I've tried to Google it. It's a little hard to find. It's it might not be an exact quote, but this is how. The paraphrase started to get into general parlance, which was that uh, Lloyd Blankfein, who's the head of Goldman Sachs, said, well, we're entitled to our profits because, quote, we're doing God's work. And by that, he meant we're allocating capital to its highest use. When I heard that, I thought, hmm, trillions of dollars going into the housing market does not strike me as allocating capital to its highest use. And that perhaps, as listeners, longtime listeners know, perhaps the source of that profit was the opportunity to avoid losses that had been uh, public policy for a while, which allowed Wall Street firms and investment banks to borrow a lot of money rather than use equity and in investment. And the lenders of that money were less prudent than they otherwise would be because they thought they'd probably get it back, and it turns out they did. Almost none of the creditors and bondholders lost any money after 2008, very few. Uh, and so – in that case, those profits were not particularly well earned. They were not providing a public service. What are your thoughts on that? We said at the outset that there's two ways to earn profits. One is to create things that other people value at a price that is below what they're willing to pay, at a cost below what they're willing to pay. The other is rent-seeking, basically investing in the political process, in this case to enlist the government as a co-signer on all loans. If I win, I get to keep it. If I lose, somebody else will pay. Those profits were ill-gotten. So one solution would be to take them back after the fact. I would say the solution is not to make those sorts of promises in the first place. We've talked about the problem of power. Once the authority has the power to make those sorts of deals, it's not irrational for companies to invest, and I'm, and I'm making air quotes, to invest in the political process because they can make more profits by doing that. From the perspective of the investor, rent-seeking and profits are indistinguishable, but from the society's perspective, there's a big difference. So I'd like to get government out of that business in the first place. But sure, given what we had done, Goldman Sachs did not deserve those profits. But it's a little late after, after they've already misallocated all of those investment resources into housing markets where they shouldn't have been in the first place. So far from correcting misallocations, these perverse incentives increased the misallocations. They got profits. We made good on their loss. It's hard to think of a worse policy. My guest today has been Mike Munger. Mike, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Always a pleasure. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.